Yeah, I think you should be ready now. Great, thank you. Okay, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. So today I'm going to talk about uh, melting at the base of the reef package in the Stillwater Complex in Montana. This is a project that uh, I've been working on with Steve Barnes, and then also uh, Yao has been helping us with some thermal modeling as well. So for those of you that might not know, the Stillwater Complex is a layered intrusion in south central Montana. Uh, it crops out over about 40 kilometers or so, has a maximum thickness of six and a half kilometers. And it hosts a very high grade uh, platinum palladium deposit called the JM Reef down here in the lower banded series in this package of rocks called the Olivine Bearing Zone 1. Um, it's currently mined at two locations. So off in the west, we have the East Boulder Mine and then the Stillwater Mine, uh, often the eastern part of the complex. So if we zoom in on that Olivine Bearing Zone, which is also called the Troctolite North Site Zone here, and expand that, uh, we have a gabbro subzone where we have these complexly interlayered gabbro-norites, norites, and anorthosites. And above that, we have uh, olivine-bearing rocks that have coarse grain textures, and these are the ones that typically host the reef mineralization. Particularly off in the, the western part of the complex, we also get a series of olivine-bearing rocks that are in sort of the foot wall to the reef package. So they're numbered here from, you don't get 01, 02, or 03, but starting at 04, uh, we have 05, and et cetera. Um, interestingly enough, in the eastern part of the complex, there's actually two 05s, an 05A and an 05B. Um, and the 05B is the one that's associated with, with the reef. Uh, this is a figure from one of Alan Boudreau's papers showing that there's an unconformable surface between the olivine bearing rocks and the foot wall uh, gabbros and, uh, and norites. So you can see that there's uh, these blue rocks that are cutting down into those gabbros that are layered. You also see that on this, this map, um, we get quite a bit of brief mineralization that's considerably far down into the foot wall. So that might suggest that these things could be mushy for some amount of time, and you have sulfides percolating down into the into the floor if that's what you want to believe. Um, and so the formation of the these olivine bearing rocks has been proposed in a couple of different ways. Uh, Alan Boudreau likes this idea that you have chlorine rich vapors that are resolved uh, during the crystallization of the gabbro-norites, and those fluids move up until they reach a, a boundary layer where the, the melts are vapor undersaturated. And so they redissolve the chlorine-rich vapor at the top of this mush. And then you have incongruent melting where you're taking these pyroxene-rich rocks and you're producing olivine and, and minor chromite. And that's his story. And I think he's had it for quite a while now. Um, during my PhD, we proposed this other, this other idea where we actually have a mushy gabbro-norite and we're infiltrating in hot, dense uh, silicate melts. And during this process, you partially begin to melt the mush and you dissolve your, your uh, plagioclase and pyroxenes and you crystallize olivine. And during this process, you also upgrade your sulfides and you produce these really high tenor sulfides because of this melt is sulfur undersaturated, you're dissolving a bit of the sulfur or sulfide that's in the foot wall. And, uh, and so we get to, to reef tenors and the grades are a little harder to explain. Uh, we have to kind of consolidate some of those high tenor sulfides into a, a thin layer in order to produce the reef. So this was our story, but we wanted to kind of field test these ideas. So we spent some time last summer collecting samples um, from a variety of trenches, which is really the best exposure of the JM reef at the surface. And so this one is off uh, sort of in the, the eastern part of the complex up on the high plateau. This is the so-called bud grid trench. Um, and you can see that the, the grades are very high, 16 grams per ton palladium plus platinum over 1.25 meters. Um, this is the outcrop map of this area, and here's where the trench is located. Interestingly enough, there's also a, a pegmatoidal uh, melagabranorite 
into the foot wall that this might be the O5A because we've seen in, in drill fans that sometimes if you go uh, down strike, you actually change from, from pyroxene bearing rocks to olivine bearing rocks. So that's one idea. And I, and I sampled this and the pegmatoidal uh, variety that was within this layer actually ran quite high for PGEs, whereas the normal cumulate texture did not. Um, and so we took a sample here, which has this, this nice transition from the footwall gabbronorite to an anorthosite, which is overlain by the mineralized JM reef leukotroctolite. And here's where we, we were able to break off a chunk. And we did some, uh, some Maya mapping. So this is uh, one of CSIRO's uh, Maya maps. Um, this is a fairly large sample. So here's a scale bar for four centimeters. The up direction is going this way. Um, should say that this is a false color image. So you've taken blue calcium map, a uh, green iron map, and a, and a red chromium map, and you've layered them on top of each other. And these are the colors that you get. Uh, the spatial resolution is about 30 microns. And it also is able to detect very small particles. So all of these little circles are the platinum hits. Um, and so you can see that there's no platinum down into the foot wall. Uh, there is a bit of base metal sulfide mineralization that's showing up as reds and oranges and yellows up here and a little bit down in this in northosite as well. But there's this really beautiful transition from a northosite down to a poikolytic anorthosite, or you could call it a poikolytic norite, depending on how you want to name your rocks. Uh, then you get more of a, a, a cumulate textured norite and then sort of a typical gabber norite. And Steve took this uh, a portion of the sample to the Australian synchrotron and did an XFM map. Um, and we can see really beautiful zoning in the pyroxenes and some, some cores. This is titanium, chromium, and, and manganese. And so then we wanted to take these ideas of what we're seeing in the textures and try and do some thermal uh, thermodynamic modeling uh, to produce that transition. And so we used melts. We started to, so we wanted to test both scenarios, this flux uh, melting model that Alan likes, and then also just partial melting by um, conduction. So an overlying injection of hot silicate melts and seeing uh, what happens when we start to partially melt uh, those, those football gabbronorites. And so we sampled a football gabbronorite at some distance away from the contact, and we got this composition. And um, so in both our scenarios, both of our models, we start with 100 grams of gabbronorite. And it, we say that the, the gabbronorite is a near solidus, so there's about three volume percent interstitial melt. And these are both isobaric models at three kilobar. So in scenario one, we're doing the partial melting by conduction. Um, and once we get a liquid proportion that's greater than 60% in the mush, the excess melt is fractionated away. And we do that for both, both models. So here's what happens in scenario one, this partial melting model. Uh, we increase the temperature. We start to, uh, to lose both pyroxenes. First, clinopyroxene goes out, and we're left with a norite. Then we lose uh, orthopyroxene, and we're left with an anorthosite. And as you can see, we're capping the silicate melt at about this point, and everything else is, is fractionated away. Scenario two where we're doing this flux melting, we're assimilating very small amounts of water at each step. So instead of temperature, now we're looking at the amount of water that's been added to the system. And we start with our gabbronorite mush. Uh, we get a lot more liquid very quickly, obviously. And pretty early on, we start to produce olivine um, as we're suppressing plagioclase. So we lose plagioclase very early as well. And uh, the olivine field is growing. So if we want to compare these two models to what we see in the field, um, we can do that. And obviously, this has been scaled a little bit. Uh, which, but you know, we do get this nice transition from gabbronorite to norite to anorthosite with our partial melting model that we don't see with the flux melting model. So the thermodynamics seem to work out OK, but uh, I was wondering about if this is thermally possible. 
And so I roped Yao into helping me do some ComSol modeling. Um, so we had a hot silicate melt flowing over cold foot wall. And just for transparency here, the, the parameters that we used. Um, so here's our, our thermal model. So we have an inlet. This is in a laminar flow regime. Uh, the temperature of the is, or contaminated chromatiite is about 1350, and our gabarinoride is at 1150. Uh, this is the point where we would have an anorthosite uh, restite. So we've got this laminar flow and then an outlet here, and you can see we're starting to move this boundary down, down into the foot wall. Um, and uh, the thermal capacity of this model was, was fixed or was constrained by our melt modeling. And so here's the end result. And we've produced this horizon that's about six centimeters thick, which is more or less what we see at that contact um, in the Bud Ridge Trench. And it's interesting, this is only 50 minutes of time. Um, and this is a, you know, a third of a meter or so. And so in conclusion, we're seeing that it's plausible to maybe form this base of reef sequence by simply heating up the footwall gabarinorites. Uh, the flux melting model doesn't seem to produce the same sequence of rocks that we see at the footwall contact. Um, but there's still a lot more work to be done. So doing some detailed mineral chemistry uh, would be nice to see what, what phases or what elements are actually zoned uh, in the pyrex scenes and see if that helps constrain some of our modeling. Um, I also have questions about scaling because it's very typical to have this gabarinorite, norite, anorthosite sequence at the base of the reef, but sometimes it's over really thick dis, uh, packages of rock. So here's just one that I happen to have a, a section for, and this is over two meters. So instead of six, six centimeters, somehow we have to scale this up. And maybe that has something to do with the permeability of the mush or the temperature of the mush when we start the modeling. Um, I'm not sure. So we were pretty close to a solid footwall at, in, in this scenario. And then I have acknowledgments and yeah. Well, thank you very much. Very interesting talk. Uh, could you please say like in the frame of this model, uh, an explanation for PG strictly like restricted to this part, which was partially molten, if I understood it correctly. Uh, so the PGEs are not necessarily only strict restricted to this spot uh, because we do see sulfide in the foot wall in various places, just it's not very common and they're small. So our whole reef model is that we're actually dissolving quite a bit of, of foot wall gabarinorite and that's where most of the PGE is coming from, in addition to this influx of new melt. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, Alan. <laughs> well, what is your actual evidence? You've got this super hot magma coming in. That's a good question. Uh, you know, this was the temperature of the melt after adiabatic ascent from our contamination modeling in the in the lower crust. I mean, because basically you look at the, say, plastic plates compositions, it doesn't change at all as you go from the football rocks into the whale into the hanging wall. Yeah, I've seen that you say yeah, that. I don't know if I'm so convinced if we looked in detail, but. Yeah, I mean, in detail, things wiggle around. A little bit, yeah. I'm saying overall, it's kind of hard to see. Plus, you know, you're not explaining certain things like, why does the olivine bearing rocks have all the chlorine in it? Um, if you're looking at a sequence like this, if you've got a. Um, uh, there you go. Uh, if you've got a sequence like that, uh, obviously you have a chemical gradient between those. those yeah. Layers. Therefore, there can be mass exchange here. So I thought you might ask this. Um, <laughs> and I think it's a bit more complicated than maybe what's portrayed in some of the literature. Uh, so we not looking for appetite, but just doing probe work over a strat yeah. section. Yeah. We found that we find chlorine rich appetite all over the place and oh, yeah. they're basically all the way down from the reef on but also above the reef well you get a few of them but as you get further up they start to disappear okay yeah. but i i mean we have i mean i agree you can go so you, in, in this image that you have you say that the olivine bearing rocks are chlorine rich and yeah. the olivine free rocks are chlorine poor we have you know yeah olivine free rocks that are chlorine rich 
and this is in the reef pack or below the reef package. Well, that's below the reef. The ones that I have are, are from from the reef package on the well this. Flat. Okay, <laughs> we can talk about it more, but um, uh, well anyway, there's a poster upstairs that gives the alternative view. Of that's right. Yeah, and there's a very nice poster upstairs. Very good. And can we get the next talk here? Thank you very much. Uh -huh.